think we are officially live. Let me just double check. Yes, we are. All right. Hi, I am Billy Griffith with Emerging Revolutionary War, uh, coming to you live with our latest edition of our Rev War Revelry or Rev War Happy Hour. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking about one of my personal favorite topics in American Revolutionary War history, uh, and, and quite possibly all of American history as well, and that is the treason of Benedict Arnold and his subsequent service in the British Army during the Revolutionary War. And I'm joined tonight by uh, two good historians, two of my favorite historians, actually, to follow uh, uh, their careers and on social media. Uh, we have Dr. Walt Powell, who he is an author, lecturer, and public history consultant based out of Plymouth, Massachusetts. He retired in 2017 as the first executive director of the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, and he previously served as well as the Director of Planning and Historic Preservation for the Borough of Gettysburg. Uh, Dr. Powell is also, he's been studying, writing about, and lecturing on Benedict Arnold for nearly 50 years, and he is the author of two books on Arnold, including uh, this one that I have right here, Murder and Mayhem. It is about Arnold's uh, 1781 raid on New London, Connecticut, as well as what's known as the Fort Griswold Massacre. Uh, which today is actually the anniversary, 239th anniversary of that event. So it just fell perfectly that we'd be doing this talk, uh, the Zoom on the anniversary of that event that Benedict Arnold, again, is so infamously involved with. Um, Mark Wilcox, he is the interpretive an interpretive ranger with Richmond National Battlefield, and he's also worked a lot with commemorating uh, for the past few years, the 1781 Arnold Raid on Richmond, Virginia, doing a lot of living history with that, which we'll be discussing as well tonight. So before we dive into Arnold's treason and before we dive into what he does with the British during the war, uh, we really need to start off with asking, who is Benedict Arnold? Okay, who was this man before his name became synonymous with the word traitor today in America? Uh, so I'm going to leave this out or this question up to either one of you to answer. Really start off, talk a little bit about his early life, upbringing, uh, then his service, brief summary with the Americans during the war, uh, and really his ideals, personality, and his reasons for why he begins to fall, you can say, to the dark side, questioning uh, his loyalty to the Americans uh, and whether he would be better off serving with the British. Well, Arnold, in many ways, is uh, a classic uh, 18th century story uh, born in Norwich, Connecticut in 1741. And he came from a distinguished family, several generations of Arnold's. In fact, his father was the first generation to come to Norwich. They had come originally into what was the colony of Rhode Island, where an ancestor had actually served as an early governor of the colony of Rhode Island and Providence plantations. So when you look at Arnold's immediate background, just a few generations, it's quite distinguished. Uh, his father, also Benedict Arnold, uh, had a pretty significant career for a number of years. He became a fairly prominent resident of Norwich, also a prominent merchant, sea captain, did quite well financially. Uh, and so the son and his siblings had all the prospects of a very comfortable middle to upper middle class upbringing uh, and a sterling education. Uh, however, uh, you know, if we look at this from, the hind from hindsight and look at it in a sense as a developing tragedy, uh, early on, Arnold's uh, family suffered some misfortunes, uh, the most notable, of course, being his father, who, for a variety of reasons, be runs into economic difficulties, begins to take to drink, uh, becomes a conversation piece in Norwich, and the young Benedict, who is, uh, as we learn, of course, as he grows up, is extremely sensitive to both the, the word honor and the, the sense of who he is and how he's perceived, uh, views this as an embarrassment. Uh, on the other side of that coin, however, he's got a mother who comes from a solid family, the Watermans, Hannah Arnold. Uh, and the early days of Benedict Arnold are not the days of a rascal who likes to kill snakes and cause other kinds of mischief, as his later biographers would claim after his treason, but rather a young boy growing up in a community that was one of the most important seaports in Connecticut that had an eye on the globe uh, shipping that went out of Norwich down the Thames and into the Atlantic and Caribbean and elsewhere was 
booming. Um, and he had a good, solid education at what we would say uh, we would call the, the high school level. Uh, so by all events, Arnold's initial upbringing was quite solid and one would have no reason to believe he might not have gone on to a distinguished career uh, without the things that would develop, of course, later. But uh, early on, both the problems his father runs into along with the death of his mother uh, and the death of siblings who succumb to disease uh, take their toll. And Arnold, uh, as a young man, uh, apprenticed with the very prominent Norwich family, the Lathrops, where he learns about the apothecary trade, about selling. Uh, of course, from his father, he learned a lot about the shipping industry. And uh, uh, he's a young man who's becoming increasingly ambitious uh, and hoping, of course, to make a name for himself. And most biographers, I think, agree that those events that uh, you know, his father's difficulties, family troubles, and so on, led to a young man who was increasingly eager to uh, prove himself. And to do that, of course, uh, he becomes extremely ambitious uh, and has opportunities which he seizes, uh, which lead to his development first as a young merchant. And then uh, in the 1760s, uh, as a young man in his 20s, he moves to New Haven marries into a very prominent family. The Mansfield family becomes a mason, uh, an increasingly important merchant, uh, builds a very, very fine house. And again, you know, seems to be on the road to success. Uh, on the eve of the American Revolution, he, he has a pretty good reputation. He's generally widely regarded in, in New Haven. Uh, we know that uh, uh, as soon as, and of course this is getting ahead of the story, so I don't want to go too far with this, but uh, we know on the, as soon as the news of the attack on Lexington and Concord, the battle there, reaches New Haven, he, with the local militia company, uh, literally demand the release of the powder, powder house. <laughs> Great story about that. Uh, and when that isn't forthcoming, he you know, threatens to take it. Uh, and then his company, of course, marches uh, north. Uh, and his career, as you say, uh, takes off from there. But a young man born in a, an important seaport town in Connecticut from a, actually two very prominent families with all the prospects of growing up uh, comfortably and well. And of course, events then step in that, that uh, change his fortunes. And I, I think that he, uh, like a lot of uh, young men in the colonial era, he was a man on the make. And I like what you were talking about, looking for opportunities, marrying well. He's not unlike... George Washington, in a lot of respects, <laughs> coming up, and uh, and especially his uh, his ardor on the on the battlefield, and he's got a temper. He's got a fierce temper when he lets it loose. Washington was like that, and he had the ability to to lead men in combat, in battle, and that's not that's something that not every commander was able to do. Um, so he, he he did have some good and courageous qualities about him, but certainly trying to make his way, trying to to get into the, uh, I guess, the gentry uh, and be part of that, part of that life growing up. You know, Mark, that's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, 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 an apt comparison too to draw a rough analogy. The two men weren't that far apart in age. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously Washington didn't have a lot of money before he met Martha and <laughs> likewise Benedict, uh, you know, had very little money, frankly, before he married, uh, you know, his wife, uh, Hannah and, uh, I mean, Margaret, his first wife and his second wife are both Margarets in New Haven. Uh, and I guess when we think about it, uh, given the circumstances, we can think of a number of prominent 18th century Americans who did well through marriage. <laughs> Absolutely. And advanced their careers. And, and, and that was somewhat of the norm. I mean, that was, not, that was not looked down upon as we would from the 21st century in terms of marrying well. You know, even if it's a, not necessarily a love match, you know, maybe that'll come later, as it did for the Washingtons. But certainly, it did behoove George Washington very well. This uh, this thread of uh, ambition and advancing his career uh, in in the late 1760s, 1770s, also, of course, leads to the first of a series of questions that some of biographers have raised about the nature of his business activities. Uh, and also, uh, as a result, uh, 
the reasons why he so staunchly supported the uh, protest against the Stamp Act and other acts that were viewed as oppressive by the uh, many colonials. Uh, there's a famous incident in New Haven, in fact, in which, uh, and this is related by several biographers, in which uh, one of his vessels uh, was inspected. And, uh, you know, the uh, question is, had he disclosed everything that was on board? Uh, uh, and one of his sailors, of course, suggests that he hasn't. That sailor is cornered in a local tavern uh, and uh, roughed up. Uh, Arnold is charged, as you may recall, uh, in the incident, has to pay a nominal fine. But uh, he doesn't suffer any long-term uh, uh, consequences from it because uh, the community's feelings at the time, of course, are extremely anti-British and, and therefore they're willing to ignore it, look the other way. Had it happened under different circumstances, however, it might have uh, you know, led to a somewhat different outcome. Uh, and we look at that incident, uh, yeah, just as one of a, a couple now in hindsight, which uh, as you hinted by talking about his temper and his ambition uh, could, could be viewed in that light. Yeah, and um, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is, as in what I've read about Arnold, you know, if you look at this as all human beings, there's a fine line sometimes between an exaggerated ego and insecurity. So the, 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 the fame and the recognition that he was looking for in the Continental uh, Service and sometimes feeling that he wasn't getting it, um, to me, smacks a lot of more of insecurity than anything else. I think he's a more of a complicated human being than maybe we, we thought in the past. Yeah, and um, that idea of uh, the insecurity because he's not receiving the recognition that he feels he deserves. He's not viewed by his peers the way he feels he should be viewed. Uh, that really begins early on for him in the revolution, almost immediately. Uh, we talk about uh, his first real involvement in any kind of operation is the capture of Fort Ticonderoga in May of 1775. Um, it's always, that's a weird situation in its own because he actually has the orders from Massachusetts, not his home colony, uh, for him to take command of a force and capture Fort Ticonderoga. He's butting heads with uh, Vermonters or uh, men from the New Hampshire grants at that time uh, under Ethan Allen. Uh, it's widely known that Allen gives Arnold no credit in his after action reports, even though Arnold was most likely the one who in a military sense was actually receiving the surrender from uh, that tiny British garrison at Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, then after that, he goes up to Quebec uh, and he takes part in an ill-fated assault on the city's walls on New Year's Eve. 1775. He's wounded in the same leg that he will later be wounded in at, at Saratoga in 1777. Um, so Arnold, a lot of the, the things that he's well known for weren't necessarily successes uh, in their own right, because you talk about uh, Valcour Island as well in 1776. It's, it's a defeat. However, it's a strategic victory for the Americans as Arnold's tiny little fleet uh, is able to buy time um, or slow down the British advance into New York, uh, he's able to escape, and this potentially saves the revolutionary cause at the beginning of the conflict. Uh, then later on, Walt, you could probably talk a little bit about what goes on at, in Danbury, Connecticut. Well, I, you know, I'd just like to back up a minute for, to uh, look at, for example, the campaign against Quebec. Uh, as I think many of those who are watching this become aware, it not only catapults Arnold to national fame, but also gains, gains in the sobriquet of the American Hannibal. Uh, you know, it's by any standards a remarkable campaign, uh, one that he pulls together in a relatively short period of time. And I think it speaks volumes about his charisma, his leadership skills, that so many men stick with him despite the hardships and ultimately, of course, the disaster in front of the fortress walls of Quebec. And yet uh, he remains there steadfast, even having been wounded and refuses to withdraw until the spring when there's absolutely no options left with British reinforcements arriving. Um, it's uh, no coincidence really that, uh, and I think it's fair to say that many contemporary historians as well as people who have had a popular interest in Arnold began looking at him differently uh, as a result of the work of the novelist Kenneth Roberts uh, starting in the late 20s and early 30s. And I'm, I'm sure he, both of you are very familiar with both Arundel and Rabble in Arms. And uh, in Arundel, Roberts, who was an historian as well as a writer, you know, makes no bones about the fact that uh, 
you know, this is an extraordinary expedition and uh, Arnold's became so close considering the odds nonetheless. Uh, but it is uh, Arnold who uh, through sheer force of will, I think, uh, manages to pull off what seems to be the impossible. Uh, and likewise, as you noted at, at Valkyrie Island, uh, and that's, that's, of course, a campaign that uh, has been much written about and more recently a good bit of underwater archaeological work has been done uh, that, that has helped illuminate our understanding of that engagement uh, in, in every sense of the word. But uh, had Arnold not had the maritime background that he had, had he you know, not had that, it's hard to imagine him leading the Falkirk fleet or pulling that operation together and leading successfully what amounted to a strategic victory, albeit the fleet was largely sunk. <laughs> uh, now, as far as the Danbury raid, uh, it, it's another example of Arnold who's recovering from wounds. Uh, and uh, he uh, it was back in the state of Connecticut trying to pull his affairs and back in order in New Haven with his uh, sister because his wife has died during his absence. Uh, when uh, there is a raid uh, on the Connecticut coast that lands and proceeds to strike the important supply depot at Danbury in 1777. And uh, Arnold takes the field despite his physical condition uh, and nearly succeeds, not quite, but nearly succeeds in forcing the British column into a situation where they cannot successfully return to their ships. Uh, that's, that's a fascinating story. Uh, it leads to the death, of course, of General David Worcester from, North, from Danbury, who was a, 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 an associate of Arnold's and a man much respected. Uh, tragic campaign in many ways, but once again, in the space of not even two years, Arnold you know, seizes the initiative and performs personally very well. Yeah, and I think there's a story of uh, at the Battle of Ridgefield where Arnold himself, while they're retreating through town, he's uh, pinned underneath his horse. And as a, a British soldier is charging with a bayonet, he pulls out his pistols and uh, guns him down before running off. So he, he definitely, he always, his personality, just it, it, his ambition, his bravery, it always put him at the forefront of basically every action he was involved in. And that was very true again later that year in 1777 in September and October during the Battle of Saratoga which uh, he is probably the most well-known for um, when Arnold, uh, he has a, a, another event that uh, will definitely lead to, you know, his uh, falling out with the American cause when he kind of butts heads with Horatio Gates following the Battle of Freeman's Farm in September 1777. He's essentially, he is relieved of command, even though he is the, the second ranking general in the American army before Benjamin Lincoln arrives. But even then you could really see the, uh, uh, Arnold's his leadership it's it's known to the men who are under him because he's thinking about leaving and heading back to uh to meet up with Washington and in the manners are begging him to stay we only want to fight under you so he does and with no command he leads a successful assault on um the uh Bremen Redoubt and is able is wounded again in that same leg that it hit at Quebec <laughs> yep uh but this wound will be much more grievous and uh I'd like to say that Arnold, the American, was actually killed during the Battle of Bemis Heights because this is going to begin his downward spiral uh, towards treason. That's a, great a lot of it has to do with that leg wound he receives. That's a great point, Billy. I've always believed that had Arnold not physically survived um, Saratoga, there would be a state name for him. There would be countless elementary schools and high schools named for him. Um, and in, in, a, in a way, it's a shame that, that he did survive because his reputation here in America certainly didn't survive. Yeah. And, and also, you could say if, if not only if, if he was killed, but what if he just went unscathed? What if the wound was minor and he was able to stay in the field? He probably would have commanded a large portion of Washington's army uh, following that. But that's just a what if, obviously. We're here to talk about the, the what did happen, not the what ifs. Um, so this leg wound, it's going to leave him out of the field. Uh, that will be the last time he actually commands American troops on a battlefield. So uh, where does Arnold end up after this? Well, of course, uh, as a result of, again, as you noted, serious wounds that lead to, in fact, he ends up having, in effect, his leg shortened by a couple of inches. He will never be able to walk properly again. Uh, and he must have been at many times in agonizing pain. I have to imagine 
just the, the physical problems there must have been significant. Uh, he uh, ultimately becomes, uh, in the spring of 1778, uh, the military governor of Philadelphia. Uh, it's a post that, uh, after the British evacuate Philadelphia, it's a post that uh, he seeks. Uh, and arguably, of course, the things that come together as a result of his taking that post uh, are, as you've hinted, Billy, going to lead him in, in the direction of treason. Uh, several things. He's in a city that has a large number of loyalists. <laughs> uh, it, it's easy to forget that, you know, despite the fact that declaration was written and signed there, uh, there were many people in Philadelphia whose loyalty is leaning on the other side and merchants, of course, that were selling to the British army actively up until their evacuation. Uh, and the families themselves, I think, personify this. Of course, he uh, rents the, a prominent mansion uh, to maintain a lifestyle which is viewed by many as overly opulent, uh, beyond his means. He gets involved, of course, in some, what some people argue are some shady business deals. Uh, and he seems to treat many of the, form, the loyalists that remain in the city with, um, in part of some people's perspectives, undue uh, leniency, even favoritism. And he links up, of course, with the Shippen family, one of the most famous prestigious families in Pennsylvania, a family divided, uh, you know, with the father's loyalties somewhat split, uh, one son serving with distinction in the Continental Army, uh, as effectively the Surgeon General, uh, and yet a famous daughter, Margaret Peggy Shippen, uh, having uh, interests that are, will continue to intrigue us. <laughs> For, for a long time. Where did, where did her loyalty really fly? Uh, and uh, it's no secret to Arnold Enthusiast that when he meets young Peggy Shippen, he's uh, absolutely smitten by her. Uh, she's, you know, less than half his age, uh, but she already has a reputation as a, a well-known socialite. She, of course, uh, got to know John Andre very well when he was in Philadelphia. And, uh, he proposes to her and then ultimately she accepts. So this, uh, of course, itself will lead in the direction of uh, a, a presumed link between Andre, Peggy Shippen, and, and Arnold, a conduit, if you will, for what can be then the, the route to future treason. Uh, so, and it leads to, of course, uh, the charges of inappropriate conduct that you hinted at earlier, uh, business dealing, using military uh, vehicles and using his position, which lead to, you know, court martial charges, which are pretty serious, all of that compounding what is already a complicated man uh, in many respects. Yeah, so um, I think uh, this is a question that a lot of people would probably ask, and I want to know your opinions. Was Peggy directly involved in turning Arnold? Do you think she gave him that push? Because they are married uh, in what, April of 1779, and, and the, by the next month, he has begun to open up negotiations uh, with the British. Well, this, um, Mark, what, what is your, what's your feeling? I'd like to let... <laughs> well, uh, certainly I'm not as well-educated on the subject as you are, Dr. Powell, but I, I've always felt that she, she had to have had some, some hand in that. She, she's playing into his insecurity, playing into his anger that he's not received the recognition that he, or advancement that he deserved. Um, and she is his wife and an ambitious young woman herself. So I've, I've always, to what extent, I'm, I'm not certain, but I've always believed that, the, that she's had some type of influence over him, especially with her connection, her, her prior connection there with the Major Andre. Um, I, what, what, what's your take? What do you think? Well, there's been a good bit of ink spilled about this a book a few years ago called Treacherous Beauty, which, of course, essentially draws the conclusion that she was an active participant in his treaties and indeed even uh, promoted uh, his, uh, urged him on. Uh, I think Steve Brumwell, in his more recent biography of Arnold, takes a more measured approach to the subject. My, my personal feelings are that Arnold adored his wives, uh, and he was, uh, you know, admittedly, as an age in which men often abuse women that uh, you know women do not, do not are not achieving the rights that they eminently deserve 
But when we look at Arnold's relationship with women, starting with his mother, he was extremely close, devoted to her. He was devoted to his sister, Hannah, who took on many of his business affairs when he was out of New Haven in the field and helped raise his children after the loss of his first wife, Margaret. And so he's a, you know, an aging, uh, he's a middle-aged man with military abilities, but certain insecurities, I think Mark is into that very well. And he marries a woman who's younger, dynamic, undoubtedly very powerfully attractive to him. And uh, she has, she's accustomed to living well, let's face it. <laughs> Uh, and Arnold wants to please her. Uh, I, I think others have already hinted at this. This isn't anything new on my part, but I think clearly there was that element there. Uh, he was sensitive. He was deeply devoted to his second wife and his family. He felt that his means were inadequate. And as we all know, he felt increasingly unappreciated by a number of people. And it seemed like an opportune time to do it. So I, I do think she not only plays a role, but unlike later efforts, her performance at West Point when Washington arrives, when she, she pretends that she is nuts, you know, that she's lost it and he is sympathetic being the gentleman that he is, when in fact it's all an act. <laughs> she's a, a consummate performer, uh, I think, and she's fully aware of what he's doing. Uh, and uh, so, yes, I don't think we'll ever know absolutely for certain, lacking the smoking gun, at least as far as I know, and somebody out there may be aware of a smoking gun, but uh, I do think she played a role, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's definitely a lot of circumstantial evidence, but uh, that evidence really points in, in her direction for the most part. But like you said, there's no real smoking gun uh, directly involving her with turning her husband uh, over uh, or to become a traitor. Uh, but another thing with Peggy, as you mentioned, she lives a high life. Arnold doesn't have a lot of money, and the money he makes, he's spending on her. So that leads to a lot of his shady financial deals, uh, as well as one of, like, including he buys her a house at the beginning, but they can't even live in it because he has to rent it out in order to pay for it. Um, but that's going to be a big thing when it comes to Arnold as well. And he's looking to potentially defect and join the British. Something he's asking for is finance, the promise of a financial security for him and his new family, because they do have a son. Uh, as well in 1780. So now he has a, a full family to look after. Um, and, and that will be one of his prerequisites is he needs to make sure he gets some money uh, for the trouble he's going through, whether or not uh, this plan to eventually turn West Point over uh, to the British will succeed or not. Uh, but now we'll, we'll kind of talk about a little bit the progress of the negotiations, because it takes a long time for uh, a plan to actually, or even an agreement um, for a plan of what Arnold is actually going to do. Uh, the British are kind of concerned, like, you know, how is this guy for real? Or how much help can he really give? A lot of the intelligence that he's going to be giving the British, it's stuff that they already know. So it's really not much of any value. But uh, I think uh, come late 1780, early 17, or, or early 1780, they really have Arnold, you know, under their thumb. Because he's gone so far, he's, he's opened up all these negotiations. If he were to fall back now, they got a lot of stuff uh, to make public that he is a traitor. And it could potentially ruin him uh, without even having to have him uh, hop sides. So anything to add on um, kind of the, the talks between British or the British and Arnold? Well, I think there's one huge element, of course, and it's one that Steve Brumwell speaks about very eloquently in his biography is the question of... Uh, how do we define loyalty in the 1770s? And, you know, the, the fact that uh, this conflict is a civil conflict, it's a civil war, it's been an ongoing civil war. I mean, it's no better exemplified than the division in the Shippen family and other families, uh, war weariness. And uh, uh, Steve makes the point, as I think, uh, you know, and he pursues it, that the, the idea, if you will, of, of uh, conveying West Point uh, had perhaps not just behind it, the notion of, you know, proving to the British his loyalty and hence, you know, making his treason pay. But more broadly, uh, did Arnold believe that by so doing, he was actually being ultimately patriotic in bringing a war that many felt was needed to end to an end, uh, an abrupt end, and, and by it sparing a lot uh, in the exchange. Uh, I think it's no coincidence that one of the names he favored, uh, Monk, uh, 
which I think was also the name used in the intelligence correspondence, was of course a reference to the general who turned on uh, Cromwell, or uh, that is the uh, parliamentary forces and facilitated the restoration of England in 1660. And that perhaps by doing this, he could restore comedy to this torn nation and emerge as a huge hero. Uh, you know, the ink will never stop to be spilled, I think, on, on that. But the long and drawn out negotiations, I'm sure in no small part, as we see it in the correspondence itself, is one, as Billy, as you pointed out, trying to find a way to prove that he can be loyal and produce the kind of material that's uh, going to be worth uh, their decision to take him forward. Uh, but also at the same time, what else is going on around him in 1779 and 1780? And it sort of also brooks the uh, you know, speculation had some other event taken place, dramatic event that drew him in, would he have then ceased <laughs> that, that correspondence and gone back to, uh, had he received the recognition that he felt he'd been you know, denied? We'll never know. Uh, but uh, ultimately the stars seem to align as far as uh, the sense uh, in British headquarters in New York that there is real possibility here. And if they can get Arnold to turn, who else might they be able to get to turn? I think it's easy to forget too that other people were approached. Uh, and clearly, I mean, the, the whole story of espionage in the American Revolution, while it's getting more and more attention, uh, still has a lot more to reveal, I think, uh, about our understanding of people's loyalties uh, and uh, you know which side they were on or ended up being on when all was said and done, uh, Arnold was caught, uh, but others were not. <laughs> double agents. Uh, there's a lot of that going on in the New London campaign. I'll get to that later, but double yeah. agents play a significant role. Yeah, and I think uh, one thing that I've learned recently that I really, and I guess um, it, it's something that Arnold will argue as well after he's already caught and he, he's, he's defected, uh, but it turns out he's kind of a, a, a big of Francophobe a little bit. He doesn't trust the French coming in on the side of the Americans. Uh, in his mind, he says, we're trying to break away from a monarchy. Why are we trying to get buddy-buddy with another one right now? Um, so there's a lot of not just personal reasons uh, that Arnold is going to eventually defect, but you know, political reasons too, in his mind, as Walt has been mentioning. He thinks it might be better off for the Americans to just go back home to the British and have this bloodshed end. Let's work it out. Um, so we've mentioned West Point now, significance of West Point located along the Hudson River above New York City. If these fortifications can be turned over, it can have a huge impact on the actual war itself, uh, because that will give the British control of the Hudson Highlands in that area between Albany and New York City. And this is really a time in the war when things they're not really going at all for either side. It's kind of a stalemate. So something as drastic as this, having West Point fall to the British could really alter the course of the entire war. So it is a big deal. And eventually Arnold will be given command of West Point in August of 1780. Uh, and what is his plan to do with these fortifications to make sure they could easily be turned over to the British when the time comes? Well, again, uh, looking at several historians, notably my colleague Steve Brumwell points a very graphic picture of the state of the defenses at West Point, how much effort had been placed into making them impregnable, but of course only if adequately garrisoned. Uh, and as, as I think you know, of course, not far from West Point was the huge supply depot at Fishkill, uh, which has often been understated. Uh, and a group actually, an advocacy group in Fishkill, New York, that's trying very hard to raise its uh, profile and to save some of the property where it actually was located. Uh, that being the case, of course, the link, the, the, very critical point at the narrows of the Hudson, uh, which ideally, if properly manned, would make it virtually impossible for any British fleet or, or colonists to get up, up river. So Arnold's plan, in essence, was to weaken those garrisons, to discreetly send men away, uh, and also to find ways to, if you will, sabotage the great chain going across the river. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a corny, but nonetheless surprisingly accurate Hollywood film from the mid-50s called Scarlet Coat with Cornell Wilde and George Sanders and Michael Wilding that actually dramatizes part of this, it's particularly this attempt to play with the chain, um, which I have to say from Hollywood is, you know, surprising. Uh, but 
you know, given the enormous amount of trust that people had in Arnold, uh, in fact, uh, one of the forts at West Point had been named Fort Arnold uh, prior to his taking command, but because of uh, the, the respect with which he was held, he would have been in an excellent position, uh, not only to weaken critical fortifications, but of course, to give the British the intelligence they needed to advance, to know schedules, uh, everything that they needed in order to make that operation feasible. Uh, so he could have done, obviously, enormous damage had he remained in that position very long. Uh, and I, I think, uh, again, strategically, historians agree that that place was absolutely critical to sustaining the continental effort, the Revolutionary War effort, had it fallen, the world might have fallen as a result. All right, so now... Come late August, Arnold has officially agreed to Henry Clinton's final terms of turning West Point over. I think the agreement involved him getting compensation of some 20,000 pounds if successful and some 10,000 if he fails at doing so. But there was also a promise of uh, surrendering at least 3,000 or so men. Uh, so essentially the size of a, of a corps, you can say, for the American Army um, as well. Come the end of September, a meeting's been set up between Major Andre, who has been serving as the liaison kind of between Arnold and Clinton. He's Clinton's uh, acting adjutant general as well as his, his chief intelligence officer. Um, so he's been the one who's actually communicating with Arnold this whole time uh, and telling him what Clinton is saying. They've set up a meeting now in late September uh, and somebody now kind of paint a picture real quick. What happens at that meeting? because uh, we know that everything just completely unravels for both men. Well, uh, I suppose the, the most critical component of this is uh, uh, in that meeting, uh, ultimately, Andre agrees not only to remove his uniform, uh, but to travel between the lines dressed uh, ostensibly as a civilian. <laughs> a, a huge mistake. Uh, this is after, you know, the initial contact. Uh, is captured in the ground in between, not far from Tarrytown, New York, uh, by three men who, frankly, one could question what they're real, or, you know, who they really are. You know, they're probably just three highwaymen. I mean, there's some argument to that extent. But in stripping Andre, they uncover, of course, the famous plans and correspondence in his boots, and uh, probably is motivated as much by profit as patriotism. They turn these over. Uh, and they reach, of course, American intelligence, who then quickly put the pieces together. Uh, so uh, Arnold does receive word that uh, of this before uh, Washington, uh, who is scheduled to arrive at West Point, does, but not with a lot of advance warning, uh, and is able to get out of there, literally leave West Point in a hurry before Washington is on to arrive. Andre then is a prisoner. Uh, of course, he will immediately acknowledge who he is. He's adjutant general, acting adjutant general and chief of intelligence. Uh, he's known to a number of American officers. He'd been part of the British Convention Army that had been captured at Saratoga and actually had been interned for a while in Pennsylvania uh, before being exchanged. So there, there you know, there, there was that knowledge. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, what's going to happen next? Uh, and to the Americans, it's clear, uh, turn Arnold back over to us and we, we will release Andre. Uh, but of course, that cannot happen. Uh, and it raises a lot of other questions. Uh, why can't it happen? Uh, first and foremost, of course, Henry Clinton, as close as he is to Andre, realizes that if he releases Arnold to the Americans, any other effort to seduce Americans to join the British cause is going to be empty. Uh, he, he simply can't do it. He tries other ways of you know, encouraging Washington to reconsider, but there is there is the stigma that uh, there is a, the memory, the long memory that remains of the hanging of Nathan Hale, the abrupt, without even a court martial, right. the abrupt hanging of Nathan Hale in September 1776. And Hale was a personal friend of Benjamin Tal Talmadge, you know, one of the chiefs of American intelligence. Uh, Talmadge hadn't forgotten uh, what had happened to his friend and Yale classmate. And so there was that element as well. You know, you didn't spare Hale. Why should we spare Andre? And uh, ultimately, of course, in early October of 1780, Andre is hanged with much regret. 
by people who weep because they see him as a gentleman. They think the wrong person is being hanged, but he's being hanged nonetheless. And Arnold, of course, is now in New York, uh, ready to move on. Uh, there, so there are so many. I mean, there are so many dimensions to that couple of weeks in September of 1780 that fascinate us. Uh, the role of Joshua Het Smith, uh, sort of the intermediary. Uh, the meeting at the White House uh, uh, on the Hudson, uh, and uh, you know the fateful decision that Andre made to, to remove his uniform. Why? Why did he do that? Uh, and and so on. Uh, but clearly, at that point, you know the, the die had been cast. Yeah. So um, after this, there's obviously a huge reaction of what has just happened. Washington himself is beyond furious. You mentioned. Uh, the little charade that goes on uh, with Peggy Shippen when she does a great acting job to convince Washington that she had no, she had no idea what was going on and she's gone insane. Um, there will be an attempt to capture Washington, or not capture Arnold, I mean, uh, in New York City, but it will fail. Uh, this is at the end of that year, 1780, uh, because newly minted Brigadier General Benedict Arnold, wearing his scarlet coat now with the British Army, has actually been ordered to sail someplace south. And we're going to lead that to you now, Mark. Discuss what happens with Arnold down in Virginia. But real quick, I think Dr. Powell has something cool to show us. Okay. Yes, yeah, so newly minted British Brigadier General. Is that clear on the camera? Yep. So this, this image of Arnold is a miniature. We don't know the artist who painted it uh, in London was after, of course, Arnold left the United States to go to England in exile, but it was painted in his uniform. Uh, it, it has remained in the family for the last two and a half centuries nearly, and it belongs to a member of the family today. Uh, so it's in a gold locket, uh, and this is a, the image of Arnold. The, the only full facial image we have of Arnold from life. Uh, reproduced for the first time in a book in the 70s by uh, Thomas Fleming. And then more recently, uh, Audrey Wallace did a little biography of Arnold that used it on the cover. And I used it in my book on Arnold back in 2004. So there he is. Very cool. Very nice, absolutely. Well, Billy, you made a, a great point uh, just in the few minutes before we went live. that So many people know that, that um, Benedict Arnold was the traitor, you know, if you talk about a traitor, you'll call someone a Benedict Arnold. But a lot of people don't know the fact that he served the Crown Forces afterwards, that he had a career in the, in the British military. And it's always amused me that, you know, he had been a major general in the Continental Army and a, Brit and a Brigadier General in the British Army. So if you want to betray your country, you expect a job demotion, you know, let that be a lesson to you. But, so yes, he gets, a, he, he, he gets an assignment to sail south and assail the new capital of Virginia, which is in Richmond, because Richmond has become a, a focal point in, in training new men and, and sending them down to the Southern Army to aid the Southern Army. And here in December of 1780, you know, they're still re, uh, rebuilding after the debacle of Horatio Gates at Camden. And um, so taking Virginia out of the war effort is, is crucial uh, to the British. So Arnold is handed a, a force of about 1,600 troops but he's still not trusted. Sir Henry Clinton doesn't specifically trust him and, and you can't blame him. He has actually turned against his, his, his own side. Um, so he's gonna send some officers to kind of keep an eye on him. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Gray Simcoe is gonna come along with his Queens Rangers, you know, uh, uh, Loyalist Dragoons. Um, the 80th Regiment of Foot, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel uh, Thomas Dundas, um, along with the Royal American uh, Legion, some New York uh, Tories or provincials, and and also Johann uh, Ewald's Jaeger Corps. I mean, these are these are some crack troops that are coming south with Arnold. He's going to sail into the Chesapeake, arriving in late December. He'll transfer to uh, some smaller craft as they're making their way up the James River, and they're going to be fired on by Patriot a Patriot battery at uh, Hood's Point and the Queens Rangers will be set ashore to, to scatter the militia, but the word's out, you know, the, the cat's out of the bag. You know, Arnold's on his way, he's in the James River. You know, Gallivers are gonna be, be heading up the peninsula to confer with uh, Virginia Governor Thomas Jefferson and again, the newly minted 
capital of, of Virginia, Richmond. And at that point, Richmond was a little better than a village. You know, maybe about 600 residents, 300 or so houses or buildings, uh, mostly of wood, you know, in Richmond. So it's, it's, it's up and coming. Um, so Jefferson's keeping a, an eye on the situation, but Jefferson believes that Arnold's target is going to be Williamsburg, you know, based on the fact that he's, he's sighted near Jamestown. Um, and so he's a little bit slower to react. He does call up the militia and to try to mobilize the state's militia. And you're looking at it could be four or 5,000 men, but it takes a, takes a, a little bit of time to, uh, to get these guys together. Um, Baron von Steuben is in the area. He is helping to do the training and to provide uh, uh, supplies and so forth to the Southern Army. He believes that Arnold's target is going to be Petersburg. Uh, they're both shocked when news arrives uh, on the afternoon or evening, I should say, of January 4th, when they find out that Arnold's forces actually landed at Westover Plantation and, uh, you know, the home of the Berg family. Uh, William, uh, uh, Berg family still living there. And and then they set out on the road to Richmond, probably most likely via uh, Route 5. Virginia militia under the Scotsman, Major Alexander Dick, is sent out to try their best to hamper the approach uh, of Arnold. But they, they, there's a few scattered shots, but really they're too weak to do anything. They're basically just falling back uh, towards Richmond uh, in, front of the, uh, in front of Arnold's force. Um, they will tear up some of the planking on the bridge over Four Mile Creek in which modern day Verona. And so Arnold on the evening of January 4th, 1781 is going to have to bivouac there for the night. Jefferson has, he'll be highly criticized for not being prepared, being you know caught napping here. But he does swing into action as best as he can. You know, he's going to begin to have public stores move across the river to Manchester. Um, that includes arms, public documents, things like that. He's going to send his family to Tuckahoe, and he'll join them there later in the evening of January 4th, but not before he visits the gun foundry at Weston, which is about six miles upriver, up the James River, and he will begin the evacuation of those military supplies as well. Uh, Jefferson will go on with his family ultimately to Charlottesville and safety there, as will most members of the Virginia General Assembly. Early in the morning, January 5th, Arnold is going to uh, resume his march, and he's just going to come basically unopposed right into Richmond. Uh, Dick's militia were going to fall back into uh, the town, and they're going to muster with other militiamen, about 200 or so, in Rico militia up on what was called Richmond Hill at the time. It's, we call that Church Hill now, Chimborazo, Libby, and so forth. They're under the command of Colonel John Nicholas. And... As Arnold and his forces come into Richmond, Route 5, and I'm not sure if you, if, you, if you know Richmond that well, Route 5 will turn into Main Street. So they're marching really up through Main Street, and that is going to basically be the same route taken by the Union Army in April 1865 as they march into Richmond. So there, I got my, my Civil War reference in for the night. Um, as they're moving into the city, they, they look to the right, and they're looking up. Chimborazo Hill, and they, they see this force of militiamen. And Arnold is going to dispatch the Queen's Rangers. He's going to dispatch the Jaeger Corps to maneuver up that hill and scatter this militia because it's still a threat. For many years, it, it was believed that no shots were fired by the Henrico militia. And I call them that because Richmond was not its own entity uh, at that point. It was a part of Henrico County. So these were, these were uh, Henrico minute companies or, or, or militia companies. And, um, but the, the diary of Johann uh, Ewald tells us that the militia actually do fire at least one volley uh, as, uh, as Arnold's forces approach, and then they scatter to the wind. You know, they flee into the woods, Ewald tells us. And that makes sense, because these are, these are untrained, pretty much, citizen soldiers that are now standing fast for a little while against, you know, some of the world's, you know, deadliest troops and most well-trained and disciplined. So I, I, don't, I don't fault these guys for running. Um, along Main Street, the 80th Regiment of Foot is going to continue on uh, into Richmond. They're going to pass uh, what we now call the Old Stone House, known as Richmond's oldest, at least oldest stone house. It's now the, the home of uh, the Edgar Allan Poe Museum. And uh, at the time, the owners of the house was a man named Sa uh, Samuel um, Age, uh, Edgy and his wife Elizabeth. And according to their family oral histories, uh, Mrs. Edgy 
said that she either stood at the door or stood at the window of that home, which was around, around 20, it's still there, 20th and Main, and watched uh, the British forces march by into her, into her town home. Um, Arnold and his staff are going to come in. They're going to take up residence also on Main Street, 19th and Main Street at Galt's Tavern, also known as a city tavern, pretty well-known public house, and get settled in there. And then Arnold is going to uh, compose a dispatch that he's going to send off to find Thomas Jefferson. And it's just a note, met, you know, offering a deal. He'll spare the city if the citizens of Richmond, Virginia will not oppose him any further, but also yield up stores of tobacco and stores of rum, any type of commodity like that that he can use. And Jefferson certainly is, is outraged. And I imagine his, uh, his response was something like what you heard in World War II, nuts, nuts to you, pal. So what happens there? Arnold, first of all, is going to, they're going to start gathering that tobacco. They're going to start gathering that rum. And he's going to commandeer around 42 ships, small vessels, uh, and get that loaded down with his, with his contraband, his booty, uh, so they can uh, head on back downstream. And then they're going to start destroying the public buildings, or what they believe to be the public buildings, um, trying to find public documents, that type of thing. And as what happens in April of 1865 as well in Richmond, the wind kicks up and spreads that fire. So Richmond is almost totally destroyed. Um, uh, some structures do remain. But ironically, uh, the temporary capital of Virginia was a, an old uh, uh, tobacco warehouse that was owned by a British company, the William Cunningham and Company. And it was known to be loyalist. And um, there were public documents. There were different things left in that warehouse, but it was it was spared by Arnold. So, and uh, of course, the building is long gone. There's a nice historical marker there. It's at 14th and Cary Streets in Richmond. Well, you know, the Queens Rangers have a long day. They've they they've marched up from uh, from Westover, and now Arnold's going to send them six miles a little bit further up along the James to burn the gun foundry there at Westover. And a lot of the material had already been moved out, but there was still some material there. I know they destroyed uh, 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 quite a lot of gunpowder just dumping it into the James River, and they'll set fire to the foundry before returning to the city. Arnold's men are going to bivouac. They're going to camp out basically up on Church Hill around St. John's Church. But, you know, these are restless young men, and they're, they're meandering through the town. I don't know if you can really call it a city at that point, but they're meandering through the town. Uh, and causing havoc. It, you know, it's not, it, it, it is ironic that they're camping at St. John's Church where just a few years before Patrick Henry had demanded uh, liberty you know, or death. And, you know, early in the next morning, Arnold's not there very long, early the next morning, it's January the 6th. And now, you know, you've got Colonel John Nichol Nicholas who has um, amassed a few hundred militiamen now. He's west of the town, west of the city. He's been given some Virginia Continentals uh, sent to him by uh, uh, Baron von Steuben. And they're going to hit, early in the morning on the 6th, they're gonna hit Arnold's Western outpost, his, his picket line out there, and drive them back in the city. There's a nice marker out there along, not far from Arthur Ashe Boulevard, uh, around Robinson Street or so. It has the wrong date on it, January 4th. Um, but that basically was the line of Arnold's picket. And they're driven back into the city. And this reminds Benedict Arnold that he is a wanted man, that you know the Virginians are now really starting to muster against him and he's got a price on his head. So he doesn't want to hang around very much longer. So a little bit later in the day on January 6th, they're gonna mobilize and begin their march back to Westover and ultimately back to Portsmouth uh, for, to, to defend that city. And um, so ultimately Arnold is in Richmond about 24 hours. Now, after telling you this story, I, as, a, as a member of uh, Richmond National Battlefield Park, I'm thrilled that we now embrace Richmond's Revolutionary War past like we haven't done before. And we have commemorated that for the last three years, uh, partnering with St. John's Church, partnering with Henricus um, uh, Historic Site. Uh, we do have a lot of living history, um, not only living, not only militiamen, but also uh, members of Richmond. Uh, who would have remembered, you know, Arnold, Arnold's visit. And I do want to plug the Revolutionary War Roundtable of Richmond. A couple of years ago, they had a very nice uh, brochure of Richmond in the Revolutionary War printed. It's a great map here of Richmond, some of the places that I talked about, and which some of those buildings are still here. 
and uh, and the story of uh, Benedict Arnold coming to Richmond. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, after that, you know, uh, Richmond, uh, eventually William Phillips, Burgoyne's old second in command during the Saratoga campaign, he's sent to Virginia. So Arnold's not in command there anymore. He's second in command. Uh, Arnold will participate again in a battle at Petersburg, Virginia in April, uh, just a few months later after he burns Richmond. Then there will be a campaign all up, along up and down the James. Um, eventually, William Phillips will die of either typhus or malaria in May, so Arnold assumes command of those forces in Virginia as well. But then finally, uh, Charles Cornwallis is sent south. Um, Cornwallis doesn't like Arnold very much, doesn't trust him. Even though I would, would like to point out that after the Richmond raid, uh, Clinton praised Arnold, uh, basically said uh, he did it as good as anyone else could have uh, there down in Virginia. But uh, because of uh, Arnold's really not needed in Virginia anymore, he's going to be sent back north. Uh, and this is going to lead now to our next operational look at uh, what, on, or, uh, what Arnold does up in Connecticut, uh, and more specifically, what happened on this day 239 years ago. Dr. Powell. Well, his return to New York, of course, is a period of uh, frustration for Arnold, uh, eager to get back in the field. Uh, we have, of course, from a number of British sources, including Frederick Mackenzie uh, and uh, Captain Peebles, uh, accounts of Arnold's uh, efforts to lobby General Clinton to get another command. And he makes a case, a fairly persuasive one, that New London and Groton are ideal objectives for a raid, uh, not only because they're New London, the port of New London was a significant haven for privateers that had done real damage to British vessels, but also continental stores were there, British prisoners were there. Uh, and uh, so the potential to destroy those supplies, perhaps free those prisoners, and in something that's only been more recently evident, prevent a raid that was being planned against Lloyd's Neck on Long Island that was actually in the planning stages in September of 1781 would effectively be thwarted by this raid. There had long been cross sound uh, trading, illicit trading, as well as, of course, raids back and forth between loyalists who had taken re refuge on Long Island, many from Connecticut and others. Um, retaliatory raids were often quite nasty, um, but at the same time, exchanges that were illicit exchanges. Uh, so Arnold had the distinct advantage, of course, of knowing New London intimately well. He'd grown up in Norwich. He, he knew the port. He knew the principal figures there, like Nathaniel Shaw, who was naval agent for the state of Connecticut, whose mansion was in New London. He knew many of the prominent merchants who owned shipping in New London. So it was an ideal assignment in that sense. So he is assigned a pretty significant force. He's given 24 ships, about 6 1,500 men and this sort of, there, there are going to be some analogies between his raid on New London and the attack on Richmond that, that Mark just talked about. Uh, 1,600 men, including three regiments, the 40th, the 54th, and the 38th regiments of foot, but also the 3rd New Jersey Volunteers, a group of loyalists, Arnold's own American Legion of Loyalists, a group of Hessian Jaegers uh, were going to be critical in the early stages of the raid. Uh, and uh, they're effort then will be to hit New London and purportedly surprise it. They're aware because of extensive back and forth intelligence of a number of critical things. When uh, the harbor defenses are threatened, two guns would be fired from Fort Griswold, the principal port in New London on Groton Heights. Uh, and that would warn the outlying militia to, to gather in close. Uh, the British were aware of that alarm gun system. Uh, furthermore, they'd had advanced intelligence gathered by no less than George Beckwith, Captain Beckwith, uh, who would be in the expedition and had been in New London uh, reconnoitering not that long before the attack. Uh, so they had a pretty good idea of the layout of the defenses, the potential strength and weaknesses of uh, New London Harbor. Uh, and uh, on the morning of September 6th, early in the morning, British fleet has spotted a duty sergeant named Rufus Avery in Fort Griswold has the signal guns fired uh, and a third gun is fired purportedly, this is according to several accounts, by a British vessel, quote unquote, deliberately to confuse the situation. Three guns apparently meant something 
something entirely different, like privateers coming into harbor or whatever. Uh, there seems to be some truth to that, although by itself, it's not the only reason that the, the harbor would have such great difficulties. So Arnold plans a landing on both sides, uh, a landing on the New London side that will be led by the Jaegers in longboats, along with the elements of the 38th Regiment of Foot and Arnold's American Legion. And on the opposite side, the Groton side at Long Point is going to land two regiments, the 40th and the 54th regiments of foot, some artillery, and of course the uh, New Jersey Loyalists. Uh, and they're gonna move gradually towards the center of both towns. Now at the time, the city of New London, the town of New London was the largest in Connecticut. It had over 5,000 people. By any measure, a pretty sizable community in colonial America when you consider that New York only had 20,000, Philadelphia 30,000, Boston 15,000. Uh, putting it in perspective, and, and Groton across the river had a population of around 2,000 or so. So pretty sizable communities. Uh, the, the anchor of their defenses was Port Griswold on the heights overlooking the harbor, named after the Lieutenant Governor Griswold. And on the opposite side of New London, Fort Trumbull, essentially a water battery named after the Governor of Connecticut, Jonathan Trumbull. Uh, the problems that become immediately apparent are sort of indicative of the problems Americans had late in the war. Uh, Fort Griswold is under garrison. It has a artillery company or Madras company and a few other volunteers, the same at Fort Trumbull. So they have to rely on pulling in militia units to augment their defenses and the hope that the privateers that are there will donate their men. <laughs> and of course, most of the privateers have only one thing in mind, getting up anchor and getting the heck out of there. Uh, so Arnold successfully lands. He does meet some opposition on the New London side, but it's minimal. He's able to move forward towards the center of New London. And there, interestingly enough, I'm, I'm struck by Mark's narrative of what goes on in Richmond, because there are interesting analogies. A, a small group of American militia gather on the heights in New London uh, and, and fire some limited number of rounds against the British. Uh, the uh, fort called Fort Trumbull has really no defense on the land side. So the commander, Captain uh, Shapley, spikes the guns and takes his men across the river to reinforce Fort Griswold. Uh, and there's a small fort in the heights of New London called Fort Nonsense. That's the joke, joke name for it, uh, which puts up token resistance and is abandoned. So the British occupy New London successfully. They uh, target buildings that are believed to have value to the continental effort, warehouses, houses that were connected with prominent patriots, but the intent was not to burn the entire city. However, once again, Mark, you talked about how fires get out of control. Same thing happens in New London. The winds pick up, the fires spread, and effectively more than two thirds of the town is destroyed. Now, Arnold, many claim that uh, he did this on purpose. This is the ultimate perfidy on his part. And there's a wonderful 19th century sketch of Arnold at a church steeple with a kind of <laughs> you know, look out over the, the, the town that he's destroying. Uh, that There doesn't seem to be any real evidence of that, but he should have known, of course, what the consequences would be. Uh, so New London, the, the privateers, some of them managed to weigh anchor and go upstream. Others are not so lucky. There was a prize ship in the harbor that was worth 80,000 pounds. That was another objective. Uh, However, on the Fort Griswold side, the circumstances were very different. Uh, the British advanced, uh, and as soon as they got within range of the fort, they asked it to surrender. They, they, they beat to parley, and the commanding officer, Colonel William Ledger, effectively said, you know, no. Uh, and he's supposed to have said, we, you know, we will not surrender. Let the consequences be what they may. Of course, in 18th century parlance means if we lose, we can be put to the bayonet. Uh, and, uh, the Fort Griswold has local militia that have gathered and some, a few privateersmen. Uh, as the British advance, they're met by some artillery rounds that are effective. Uh, and in fact, they make two separate assaults on the fort, which fail and take very heavy casualties. Uh, but on the third assault, the garrison is overwhelmed. They manage to get through the gate uh, and over the parapet. Uh, and uh, the commanding officer, Colonel Ledyard, at that point purportedly said, uh, you know, off told the garrison to surrender, lay down their arms, offers his sword in, in surrender to a British officer who then purportedly ran him through with his own sword. And then a quote unquote massacre of the garrison follows. 
and some 80 men are killed or badly wounded as a result of the uh, attack by approximately 800 British soldiers. Uh, the attack on the fort then is costly from both sides' perspective, tragic, of course, from the American side because so many of the garrison were related, fathers, sons, uncles, nephews, husbands uh, are killed, devastating to the town of Groton and the surrounding communities. Uh, Arnold really doesn't need the fort at this point. And there is fair evidence that he had sent a dispatch across the river to call off the assault, but it didn't happen. At least that's Arnold's claim in his after action report. Uh, whether it you know, is true or not, there's some question of that. The British uh, then evacuate, that as they go back to their ships, they take some of the American wounded who are prisoners uh, in Fort Griswold, uh, and uh, they go back to New York. Now, uh, several things about that raid, of course, will resonate to cement the image of Arnold as the ultimate devil in the minds of many Americans. First of all, uh, at Fort Griswold, the death of Colonel Ledger, the honorable, well-known colonel, was he murdered by his own sword, you know, infamous murder by another British officer. Uh, I argue in my study that it was likely a bayonet wound by a soldier who got carried away rather than deliberate, uh, but that's, that's a highly controversial point. Uh, also, there are alleged atrocities against American prisoners that the British were dumping them in an ammunition cart and they lost control of it, went careening down the hill towards the river and men were popped out of the cart you know, and, and treated poorly. Uh, it appears that that's largely more propaganda than, than uh, fact, I mean, not deliberate in any case. Uh, and that Arnold, uh, you know, all of this is deliberate on Arnold's part. The reality, however, is that there were loyalists in the expedition uh, especially on the New London side uh, that were in that attack. Uh, men were killed, large, more Americans died at Fort Griswold in that single action than almost anything else that happened in Connecticut for, for a number of years in combat. Uh, and uh, the perception was that this was, as many called it, treason of the blackest die. He's leading an attack against his own hometown, for, for God's sakes. The town, the area that he grew up in where he knew people intimately well, and what's he doing? The ultimate treason. So looking back on it, and I argued it was perhaps a tactical success, but a strategic failure. And more importantly, it didn't do anything to divert American attention against the bigger objective further south, uh, if that had been more to the plan. Uh, and more to the point, Arnold did nothing to cement his reputation by that raid. Had he really thought about it, he, he should have simply suggested that he do something different. Uh, instead, he created, you know, an image that people would never forget as a result. And uh, the, the death of Colonel Ledyard and some of the other incidents that occurred in New London remain so firmly entrenched uh, in popular legend that when I had a chance to speak there on a couple of different occasions, I was viewed as an iconoclast, you know, you know who is this guy who's challenging these quote unquote absolute truths impugning the memory of these men rather than trying to get to the actual evidence as we you know, have been able to unearth it. Uh, I might mention to our audience too that a very fine young scholar uh, who is the, and this is a Civil War pitch too, the director of the New England Civil War Museum uh, in Rockville, Connecticut, Matt Reardon, has a book that's coming out very shortly, Sabbath Beatty Press, on the attack on New London that has a lot of material in it that I certainly didn't see when I was doing my research a number of years ago, and I've had a chance to look at portions of it in draft. It's going to be a very fine study, probably the definitive one uh, on New London for a long time. Uh, so when Matt Reardon's book comes out, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear a lot about it. And uh, my hat's off to, to Matt for the work that he's done on it. All right. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I think we, we've definitely blown past that hour mark. Right <laughs> we are worried for nothing. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, what it is, there's so much to talk about Benedict Arnold, which is, again, why he's, it's one of my favorite stories uh, in American history, and he's one of my favorite personalities to, to, to learn about. Um, to kind of wrap it up a little bit, we're not going to go too much into Arnold's life after the Revolutionary War. Uh, he returns home in uh, October of 1781, I think, uh, that he really doesn't serve in a military capacity, per se, anymore in the British Army. Uh, falls on hard times a bit after that, and he ends up in Canada, correct? Near Ontario, I believe? Well, no, in, in uh, New Brunswick. 
uh, to get substantial land grants there uh, and actually established as a business in St. John's. Uh, there's, there's a good bit of material about that that's been published, including uh, you know material in some more recent biographies of Arnold. Uh, he does, of course, as you know, offer his services again and again, and he does a fight in the Caribbean during the Napoleonic Wars as a civilian attached to the East India Company, uh, where uh, you know he, he has pretty significant role. He's in Guadeloupe and, and elsewhere, uh, as Steve Bromwell and others point out, Willard Stern Randall and his fine biography of Arnold. So he has a, a post-revolutionary career. It's just not that well known. But his business enterprises, of course, are what gets him into difficulties. And uh, uh, he lives in exile for most of his life then in, in London leaves Canada, returns to London, uh, and dies in London in June of 1801. Yeah. Of so, uh, he, he dies of, of gout, right? Yeah, yeah which he contracted in 1775 or around then. Yeah, and that was in his good leg too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so to kind of wrap this up uh, real quick, ask, um, you know, we've mentioned some books tonight. Uh, if you were going to recommend any book on Arnold or any battle or campaign that Arnold is really involved in uh, that really veers in on him, what would uh, you recommend to the people viewing us tonight? Mark, you want to lead off? And I'll... Uh, well, it's kind of hard to say. I, I don't really care to focus too much on the treachery. I love anything that's on Saratoga. I love his, his actions on, in, in, at Saratoga, being relieved of command and coming back to you know, to lead that charge. So I would, you know, any, anything on, on that battle, I think would be appropriate. I'd, I'd get back to it. This is historic fiction, but I'd start by anybody who's not read Kenneth Roberts or Rundle, the novel, and the March to Quebec, which in which uh, Roberts pulled together all the known primary sources about the Quebec campaign in a separate volume, which is a remarkable work of scholarship when it came out uh, in the early 1930s. Uh, Arundel really sets the stage for asking a lot of these questions in a dynamic historical novel, uh, which has always been a favorite of mine. Uh, and his, his sequel, Rabble in Arms, which leads to the campaigns against Saratoga and of course the Mohawk Valley. Again, historical novels, but incredibly good reading with of course the caveat that he's an historical novelist. And then more recently, uh, I would put Steve Brumwell's biography right at the top uh, called Turncoat. Um, it's, uh, you know, it will, I think, stand as one of the definitive biographies of Arnold for a very, very long time. Stephen Brumwell, the British historian who lives in Amsterdam. All right. And this is a question for both of you real quick. If you can sum it up in a sentence or two, you know, what do you find the most fascinating about Arnold? What draws you to actually open a book and try to learn more about this guy? And uh, do you think that his legacy you know, his image will ever change to the American public, uh, how they perceive him, or will he always be just known as the traitor, Benedict Arnold? I think his reputation will never recover. And I'm most interested in just what made this guy tick in terms of his ambition, in terms of his insecurity, what, make him, what made him think this was the, the path to go down. And I, I wonder what he would think of his actual legacy. How would it affect him if he were able to, to know what Americans felt of him and the way he's viewed today and how that would have affected him? Um, but I absolutely do not believe that his reputation will ever recover. Well, if we know anything, we know that history is always changing and, and new evidence comes forward. Of course, we, you know, we've had things turned on our head more than once. So I, I, I keep a somewhat open mind on the subject. I, I don't excuse the idea of treason for any reason, but, you know, is it quite what it seems, as Steve Brumwell asked, and I've often felt that way there. Um, in essence, should we reject everything that he did based on one enormous mistake from our point of view that he made? And I think many have made the argument that he saved the colonies, that he saved our revolution by his remarkable actions prior to 1778. And for that, he deserves to remain to be remembered albeit a complicated person. So I think it's that that keeps me fascinated with Arnold. And frankly, his descendants uh, were remarkable in many ways. They made you know, important, not widely known, but important contributions to the British military and British society. And looking at it from that standpoint, meeting his descendants, they're proud of that. Uh, they're proud of the fact that, uh, you know, so in effect, uh, 
yeah, maybe the American public as a whole was pretty ignorant as we know of American history, but as a whole may never forgive him. But I think historians are gonna to continue to ask lots of questions about it. Yeah, definitely good points. I mean, for me, his story, I feel like it's one of the most human stories out there. Okay, it's a story based on real human emotions. You can actually relate in some cases to what he is feeling. Like Mark said, you know, trying to figure out what's making him feel this way, what makes him tick. Uh, and, and it really is a lot different, especially for characters from that period in history. Uh, they're very, yeah, just stoic and, and marble-like, just like statues. They don't always give off the most personality. But Arnold, he, uh, you know, he was a man who reacted based on emotion. And, uh, and everything you read about him, uh, you definitely can, can see that he felt. And as we've discussed tonight, he wasn't just a bitter, evil man. He, he, he was a lover. <laughs> he was a fighter. He was, uh, he, he, he was definitely a, a very human-like historical figure, which is tough to find sometimes when you're doing research, uh, especially from that era. So I think we'll wrap it up now. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who tuned in to this hour and 20 minute long Zoom session, probably one of the longer ones that we've actually done, but it was awesome. I mean, we never ran out of material. It's definitely a subject, never run out of material on. Uh, thank you, Mark, for joining us. Thank you, Thanks Dr. For Mel. Me. And uh, look again, uh, check our website or, and our Facebook page to find out when our next Zoom session is going to be. Not too sure what next week's subject will be, but we definitely will be having one. Uh, so on behalf of Emerging Revolutionary War, thank you for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your Labor Day weekend. Thanks.